This lecture is for the course HLSC 4120. Um, the topic is Grounded Theory Research. I'm Mike Hazelton from the School of Nursing and Midwifery uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to do this presentation for you. The origins of, of Grounded Theory really, really go back to the early 1960s and the then pioneering work of two social scientists Barney Glazer and Anselm Strauss. Uh, both these uh, scholars, these researchers, were working in the United States in the early to mid-1960s. And they developed, um, uh, really they, they, they originated uh, grounded theory and developed uh, what is widely still considered the, the, the classic version of it. There have been uh, uh, developments uh, and changes methodologically over the decades since but nevertheless, the, uh, the names Glazer and Strauss are very much synonymous with grounded theory research. The classic version of grounded theory, and, and that was um, really described in their land-breaking book of 1967 entitled The Discovery of Grounded Theory, has subsequently been elaborated by both of the originators. Glazer and Strauss have both written subsequent uh, substantial papers and books subsequent to that, that original classic publication and they have been joined by others who have also become very known, well known in the field such as Julie Corbin. The term grounded theory is intended to indicate an approach in which systematic and structural research techniques are used to generate theory from social processes so that the theory can be said to be grounded. In other words, rather than the researcher or research team going into the field with a pre-developed theory which they want to test. In grounded theory, the process operates, as it were, back to front. Uh, really, the researchers are going into the field with as few preconceived ideas in relation to the phenomenon of interest uh, as possible, and they attempt to build theory from the study of whatever it is they're interested in investigating from the ground up. And in that sense, the theory they build is grounded in the work that they've undertaken in the field. As I've said, Glazer and Strauss were social scientists. One was a sociologist, the other a social psychologist. And interestingly enough, they were working in an American-based nursing doctoral program. And what we've seen since is a generation of their often uh, doctoral, original uh, nursing doctoral students and other colleagues um, have, have built upon that initial work. And they've really assisted in spreading uh, the whole um, field, if you like, of grounded theory research around the world and, and, and across quite a number of disciplines, uh, establishing the methodology and methods of grounded theory in nursing and many other forms of health and indeed educational and social scientific research. So some definitions. The following Holloway and Wheeler um, grounded theory can be thought of as a research method that generates theory from, from the data through constant comparison, and I'll say more about what is meant by constant comparison as we get further into the lecture. Uh, the, if you like, the, the underlying theoretical approach that sits behind grounded theory is symbolic interactionism. This is an interpretive approach in sociology that focuses on how meanings are made and how these meanings arise out of the ways in which people interact with each other. Uh, the term theory has a particular meaning um, in, in grounded theory. In general terms, when, when we think of a theory, we're thinking of a set of interrelated concepts and propositions that explain a particular phenomenon of interest. In grounded, theory, in grounded theory, the term theory relates to a set of interrelated concepts and propositions that explain a social phenomenon. So in science we have theory, and, and often of course scientific theory relates to the natural and physical world. The term theory in the context of grounded theory always relates to a social phenomenon. In other words, it, it, it can be traced back to interactions between people under, under particular circumstances. A concept um, broadly is defined as an abstract or generalised idea that describes a phenomenon. So we might think of, for instance, 
the concept of anxiety. Um, and you might debate whether anxiety as such exists in the natural world or whether it has come to refer to a set of um, uh, behaviours, feelings and cognitions, thoughts, ideas and feelings that, that people, uh, and indeed um, bodily processes that people have that collectively we have combined under this, this central idea of anxiety. Um, and a construct might be thought of as encompassing a number of concepts or categories. And this has a high level of abstraction. These are often used for a major category that has been developed from the reduction of a number of smaller categories. And I think it will become clearer as to the way in which those terms, theory, concept and construct, are used in grounded theory as we go through this particular presentation. A few words now about symbolic interactionism, which I've already suggested is the underpinning theoretical framework for grounded theory. This was really developed through the work of philosophers and social scientists in the earlier part of the 20th century, such as George Herbert Mead and Howard Blummer. And both of these people wrote extensively um, books and other papers um, that can be accessed if you were to do a search uh, on symbolic interactionism. You would certainly see the names George Herbert Mead and Howard Blummer and their publications come up as a result of that search. Symbolic interactionism focuses on the processes of interaction between people, especially human behaviour and social roles. It's generally taken to explain how people act in relation to others, so it focuses on interaction. It accounts for and interprets the actions of others, and in this sense it looks upon those actions as being symbolic, the meanings that are symbolised or the meanings that arise out of the way in which we interact. And, there, and it's also interested in the way in which we reorganise our own actions in response to the actions of others. And this gives rise to this idea of action. So the, 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 the dominant ideas emerging out of symbolic interactionism are interaction, symbolism, symbols, and action. This is very much an action-oriented approach, and I'll say more about why that's theoretically and methodologically important in a little while. It comes down to a thing known in the literature as the structure agency debate. <clears throat> um, briefly now, um, during the 20th century, particularly uh, around the middle of the 20th century th through to the 1960s, through to the 1980s, there was a debate going on within the social sciences about um, whether people are largely shaped. In other words, the way we think and act, uh, are those thoughts and actions largely shaped as a result of the environment, including the institutional environment within which we exist? In other words, are we largely shaped by social structures, or in fact, uh, and therefore, if you like, we are on the receiving end. Um, we, we tend to be passive recipients of larger structural sorts of things that are going on around us, or in fact, are we much more active in that? Are we shaping our own, rea uh, our own reality? And this is what's known as the agency structure debate, and I'll say more about that presently. A key theoretical point here <clears throat> is an emphasis on agency, that is, participants actively shaping their social reality rather than being the passive recipients of that reality. And, and this really sits within that context of the agency structure debate of the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And that debate was about trying to determine whether um, reality as we know it is largely shaped by humans and that we shape the reality around us, the social reality, or are we shaped by the reality of the institutions that, yes, we have created, but those institutions take on their own reality and, if you like, they start to shape us. Um, and that debate has largely, well, I wouldn't say it's been resolved, but it's probably not as fought out as, as aggressively as it was several decades ago. And I think nowadays most social scientists, most researchers would point to both of those poles having fairly equal amounts of input that clearly... As, as humans, we shape our own environment, but at the same time our environment shapes us to a certain extent as well. So that if the theory, uh, the agency, the st uh, structure debate 
has been resolved and I think perhaps it, it would be fair to say it has to some extent. It would be in so much as we recognise the importance of both structure and agency in the formation of social reality. A few words on the ontology or the ontological basis to grounded theory. Ontology, of course, relates to a theory of being. So if we're looking at the ontology of grounded theory, we're, we're looking at the theory of being that underpins symbolic interactionism and thus grounded theory. And we would note that this constructs the individual as an active and creative rather than a passive individual. And as I've said earlier, this is fundamentally important to the theory and methodology of grounded theory. Holloway and Wheeler, in their text on page 153, explain this well. And by the way, the references are included on the final page of the PowerPoint presentation for this lecture. They put it nicely when they say that individuals plan, project, create actions and revise them. People share their attitudes and responses to particular situations with members of their groups. Hence, members of a culture or community analyse the language, appearance and gestures of others, and act in accordance with their interpretations. On the basis of these perceptions, they justify their conduct, and this, is con and this conduct can only be understood in context. In other words, we take a very active uh, stance, a very active role in shaping our own reality, but it's important to always consider that reality within the particular context within which it exists. So, one of the important considerations in grounded theory is the nature of a grounded theory research question. Grounded theory is an appropriate methodology in situations when little is known about a phenomenon of interest. In other words, if you want to open up a new field to inquiry, or when a researcher might wish to approach an existing field of inquiry from a new perspective. Why might we want to approach it from a new perspective? Well, perhaps there's quite a number of studies out there in the literature that, that address uh, a phenomenon such as surviving cancer, for instance, but that work's been largely survey work. It tells us some important things about what it's like to survive cancer, um, but perhaps we might feel that there are certain aspects of the experience of surviving cancer that are not well covered in survey-style research. Perhaps we might feel that, that we'd like to have a much deeper, more in-depth understanding of what it's like to survive cancer and maybe surveys don't provide the opportunity for that deep type of understanding. Grounded theory might be an approach we could adopt that would enable us to perhaps deal with a smaller, much smaller group of people who have survived cancer but to generate much more detailed information about the nature of what it was like to have cancer and survive it. So we wouldn't suggest that grounded theory is a better research method, for instance, than survey but we might argue they complement each other. The survey approach tells us one lot of important things about what it's like to survive cancer, but a grounded theory approach would tell us another important lot of things about what it's like to survive cancer. When you put the two together, they give us a much more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of that thing we're interested in. Another important consideration is, and this goes right back to Glazer and Strauss's original 1967 text, they actually suggested that perhaps it would be useful in grounded theory to refrain initially at least from developing a highly uh, constructed research question. They were much more interested in the researchers identifying a broad area of interest um, than really coming up with a highly specified research question. And on this slide you see two examples of that. Uh, if we were looking, and this relates to actual research that I conducted a few years ago, I was interested in finding out what it's like for new graduates, in this case because of my disciplinary background, graduate nurses, what it was like for them in their first year as a new graduate working uh, within the mental health field of our public health services. Um, and, uh, and if I was going to specify that as, as a fairly tightly constructed research question, that question might be worded as follows. In what ways do new graduate nurses use group mentorship to help them settle into beginning employment in a regional public mental health service? Now, I could use that question in grounded theory. There's nothing wrong with doing so. But Glazer and Strauss at least initially argued that it might be better 
to more broadly state an area of interest and use that as the guiding force, um, uh, the, the, the driving consideration in conducting the research, certainly in the early stages. And I'll say a little bit more about why that is in the moment. But if we were going to come up with a broader statement of area of interest, it might be worded again in relation to the same topic of the experiences of new graduate nurses, the use of structured group mentorship in assisting the transition of new graduate nurses from university to the mental health workforce. So there you see fundamentally the same problems stated in two ways. One is a broad area of interest, and two is a much more clearly and highly specified research question. Both are workable, um, but at least initially Glazer and Strauss's preference would have been for the former rather than the latter. Uh, the main reason for that, I think, is that they felt that if you're going into the field and you're trying to maintain an open attitude about what you might find in the field as you move into it, it's probably better to start with a broad area of interest rather than a highly specified research question. The main reason being that once you start highly specifying a research question, it brings all sorts of assumptions uh, into play and perhaps it too narrowly focuses your area of interest down. And they were concerned that if you were to too narrowly focus your range of interests around a research topic, you might, in, you might actually overlook important aspects of that phenomenon of interest, at least in the initial stages. And I do think that that, that is a fair, uh, uh, a, fair, a fair comment. Some key features of grounded theory. At the broadest level, grounded theory sets out to generate or modify theory from data. It has sometimes been argued that up to a point, grounded theory looks very similar to what is described as qualitative, uh, to, to other qualitative research approaches, but that it goes much further in generating theory. And hopefully it'll become clearer as to what that is pointing to as we get further into the lecture. For instance, qualitative descriptive research, and you'll see that referred to in the literature if you do a search, um, and I've given you a reference there for qualitative descriptive research. That's Sandalowski, who's one of the gurus in that form of qualitative research. But for instance, qualitative descriptive research looks very much like grounded theory, except that the reporting of results in the former is generally restricted to describing aspects of the phenomenon of interest, rather than generating theory about it. In other words, in qualitative descriptive research, you're describing a thing you're interested in, and that's about as far as you go. Um, in grounded theory, the descriptive level is about halfway through the process. Once you've described the phenomenon, you've come up with categories, you've clustered the categories, you've developed broad themes, you would then go on and start to look at the interrelationship of those themes to each other and other phenomenon of interest, and out of that you would build a theory. So you can see how grounded theory, because it is theory generating, sits uh, well above, if you like, in terms of the level of abstraction achieved over some of the other qualitative approaches to research, and particularly qualitative descriptive research. Both have their uses, and again, I'm not saying that qualitative um, descriptive research is an inferior form of research to grounded theory, but they are really looking at different aspects of the research process, where you want to describe something, and that's where you end. You would use qualitative descriptive research, where you want to build theory about it, you would go on and, uh, and, and follow the grounded theory approach through to its conclusion. An important but nevertheless contentious feature of grounded theory is an attempt to avoid the infiltration of preconceived ideas regarding the phenomenon of interest. This is sometimes referred to as bracketing, and I'll say more about that presently. But just note that point for the time being. It harks back to one or two of the comments I made uh, a slide or two back uh, about why we might want to uh, refrain, at least initially, from highly specified research questions because of the risk um, that perhaps some preconceived ideas uh, might end up uh, uh, sort of caught up in the initial stages of the research processes um, because, we've, because of the way in which we, we've framed the research question. Still with key features of grounded theory, the research process there thus starts with an area of interest or the identification of a problem. Data is collected in relation to that area of interest uh, or problem, and I'll go through and give you more detail about the nature of data collection. Data analysis 
involves techniques which allow for the development of ideas about the area of interest or the problem that has as far as possible have not been influenced by theoretical and or empirical assumptions. So this is the idea of bracketing. In other words, we should try as much as possible and not take preconceived ideas, prior experiences um, and other sorts of prior considerations into the research process. Now, as you might imagine, this is actually much more difficult than, 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 than the words on the, uh, on the slide might imply. Um, one of the implications, as you'll see pre presently, is that Glaser and Strauss cautioned against reading too widely into a, uh, a particular field prior to conducting uh, um, grounded theory research for that very reason, so that we wouldn't be taking the prior learning of the, uh, the literature review stage into the research process. And unlike most other forms of research, qualitative and quantitative, in grounded theory, the bulk of the literature search and literature review is ordinarily conducted as part of um, uh, the write-up stage of the findings as we start to determine what the findings of this particular study, our study, mean relative to other things that are known about the phenomenon of interest. The theory generated must be grounded in social reality, it must be understandable to the participants and those who might work with them, and I'll say more about that presently. And the theory generated must also be applicable to similar settings and contexts to that in which the research was conducted. So although grounded theory research typically uh, is undertaken in particular field settings, it's important because we are generating theory from this that we look um, as much as possible uh, toward the ways in which the major findings coming out of the study that we have undertaken might be applicable in other similar areas. So if we're undertaking grounded theory research into aspects of adult acute inpatient psychiatry, and the question might be, what is it like to be admitted to uh, an early 21st century What's the experience of being admitted as a patient to an early 21st century uh, uh, adult acute inpatient psychiatric unit? Um, the findings of that study within Australia, the findings of that study you would expect to be broadly applicable to um, the experience of being admitted to similar sorts of units in other parts of the country. So we, we'd be looking for broad c categories, broad themes that ought to be if not generalizable, at least they ought to be recognizable uh, in, in, as, as being similar in, in other similar service settings. And again, still sticking with key features of grounded theory, you'll see in the grounded theory literature uh, a reference to what's, what's referred to as constant comparison. And this is comparison of each section of the data with every other section throughout the study searching for similarities, differences, and connections. So, for instance, if we go back to the example I've just given, we're conducting research in adult acute inpatient psychiatric services, um, and we're collecting data from patients, we're doing field observations about the interactions of patients with other patients, of nurses with patients, with doctors with nurses, with other categories of health professional staff with the nurses, the doctors and the patients, and say we come up for argument's sake with five or six different categories, uh, broad categories of data, so there might be field observations, there might be group or individual interviews, there might be the reading of case notes, there might be the exploration of clinical protocols that are, that are kept on the ward. We'd be comparing the data we've generated from each of these areas with data from each of the other areas to try and work out um, how they relate to each other, the similarities, the differences, are there contradictions between them? Um, do, do one group of players tell us one thing about the nature of interactions between all these groups of people within this setting while another group tells us something quite different? For instance, and we're trying to build up a very nuanced, very complex picture of these social interactions, uh, comparing each of these different sets of data against each other across the different time periods in which we're selecting this data. As you can see, and that as, as hopefully you're starting to appreciate, 
Um, this can be very labour intensive indeed and I'll come back to that at the very end of the presentation. As you've probably started to gather and as you would expect in many forms of qualitative research, data analysis involves the coding and categorisation of data from which concepts and constructs are formed. The aim is the identification of key themes from which a narrative or a story can be constructed uh, in relation to the phenomenon of interest. And I'm going to give you an example of these things building ultimately to the construction of a narrative from some of my own recent research toward the end to try and flesh this out uh, and to give you a much more concrete understanding of how these quite abstract ideas look when you put them into effect, when you put them into operation uh, with, with an actual research process. Still sticking with data collection. Data collection, as I've suggested, can involve field observations, interviews with participants, the use of diaries and journals, clinical records, media materials such as newspaper articles uh, and again um, we could for instance I, I've not used them in grounded theory research although I've, I've, I have analyzed media materials using other forms of, of qualitative methodology but I haven't using grounded theory research but in principle you could you could for instance if you you know you might be interested in finding out what the media says about issues in adult uh, psychiatric services say in the last couple of years so you could do a media and newspaper search to see whether any articles have been published uh, in the local or national media, uh, particularly the print media that, that covers that broad topic area, and see whether the stories that are presented there are similar to or quite different to the narratives that are built up from the players who actually work within the field. That could be an interesting comparison. And of course, sometimes you could even use quantitative research m measures I have a PhD student who's just finished his thesis in, in being examined at the moment who used a combination of most of those other uh, 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 data collection types that I've just referred to but he also chose because he was dealing with uh, health professionals who'd been assaulted in the course of their professional work. Um, he also wanted to take some uh, empirical measures of, for instance, um, whether or not they were anxious, whether they were highly, whether they were distressed whether they were depressed, not because he wanted to generalise to, a, uh, 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 to a, a broad population, but because he just wanted to be able to say whether the people he, he was interviewing at the time of the interviews um, actually demonstrated uh, symptoms um, of depression or anxiety or, or some sort of subjective distress immediately following having been assaulted. Um, he interviewed these people within a week of an assault experience then followed them up at six and 12 months and, and I'm sure you can understand why it would have been important if his study for him to be able to quantify any underlying symptoms they might have been experiencing that might have coloured the way in which they gave information to him um, uh, using you know in his grounded theory research project and he used that very effectively in that project. It can sometimes be difficult to differentiate data collection from data analysis and grounded theory and in a sense analysis commences with data collection so in the student whose work I just referred to, uh, he went back and collected data on three separate occasions um, with about 18 participants over a 12-month period. But he started analysing data from the first interview he'd conducted and the first lot of field observations he'd conducted um, uh, right from the very beginning of the study. Uh, so he was systematically analysing the data as he was collecting it across about a, an 18-month to two-year period. Um, so that that's not only permissible within grounded theory, it's probably desirable. Now some, um, some analytical terms, uh, largely, in terms of data collection and analysis in grounded theory. The term theoretical sensitivity in grounded theory is, refers to the sensitivity and awareness of the researcher to detect meaning in the data. In other words, in broad terms you'd expect the more experienced the grounded theory researcher, the greater their theoretical sensitivity um, to the, uh, the phenomenon that's being studied. That's what you would typically expect. Uh, in other words, you know, as you become more experienced in doing anything, you usually become better at doing it. What are the sorts of things that might impede uh, or, or interfere with theoretical sensitivity? Well, bracketing um, is an important consideration here. Taking preconceived ideas, assumptions, prior ideas, 
ideas that might have been formed from uh, too comprehensive a reading around the topic of interest prior to initiating the research itself. These sorts of considerations are said to be possible impediments or factors that might undermine theoretical sensitivity. In other words, leaving yourself as open to the discovery of, of a whole range of things uh, which um, really, in many instances, which you might not have expected to find. So trying to maintain uh, a methodologically open mind as you go into the, uh, the research process really is at the heart of this notion of theoretical sensitivity. Theoretical sampling is an interesting term. This refers to an approach to sampling, to the, uh, to the accessing of a group of study participants or respondents, which proceeds on the basis of emerging relevant concepts and is guided by the developing theory. So, for instance, if you go back to the example of grounded theory research undertaken in a mental health acute adult inpatient services, um, it may well be that, that at some point you discover that the security guards in that particular unit have much greater influence in respect to the management of groups of patients considered to be at risk or potentially dangerous than what you might have imagined. And whilst your initial research protocol might not have even included security guards, you may well decide that it would be very appropriate halfway through your research to expand your study protocol to include interviews with a couple of security guards who, who fairly frequently are down or are called down to, uh, to that particular unit when uh, there are uh, issues that go on with staff or, uh, around uh, patient violence or aggression, for instance. That might not have been part of your original plan, but because of what you've discovered and because uh, aggression and, and risk of aggression is an, is an important emerging theme within your research in the area, you make what I think would be a very sensible decision to include some data collection with respect to security guards. Um, and, and of course, you would probably have to go back and uh, seek ethics committee approval to, uh, to access that group of people if they weren't included in your original protocol. But that would be a good example of theoretical sampling. Data coding refers to the process by which concepts and themes are identified and named during analysis. And I'll give you some examples of that presently. Data categorizing refers to the process by which raw data is reduced to build categories, and the aim here is to form clusters of concepts rather than to just describe the themes. I've mentioned constant comparison previously. This refers to qualitative data analysis where each section of the data is compared to every other section of data in the research record. Uh, integration of theory, this pertains to the extent to which categories are interconnected and closely linked to enhance uh, to the data to enhance the explanatory power of the theory. And in broad terms, we can think of a couple of different types of theory. A substantive theory emerges from the study of one particular context, setting or group. So for example, a, a particular clinical setting or a group of patients. So examples of that might be the um, uh, the inpatient adult psychiatric unit I've used as an example several times already, or a group of patients, this might be a group of patients or a group of people, the people I referred to previously who have survived having had cancer. You could build a substantive theory about either of these, uh, these phenomena of interest, phenomena of interest, um, but your study would be restricted in terms, uh, in terms of the themes that are, 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 are developed and the theory that are developed from those to those particular uh, to similar service settings or similar groups of patients. You, you would not expect to be able to generalise uh, aspects of surviving cancer um, uh, across into, say, aspects of surviving H HIV AIDS, for instance. You would expect there would be quite significant differences. So you're talking about substantive theory at that level. Formal theory tends to be generated or a range of situations uh, and settings uh, uh, Sorry, formal theory tends to be generated for a range of situations and settings and, is, and tends to be much more highly conceptual. So you might have a theory of survivorship overall, which might take into account the experience of surviving cancer, the experience of surviving um, uh, what else would be a, a heart attack would be another example, uh, survivorship, the experience of surviving HIV AIDS, and you might um, 
Whereas you might build a substantive theory about each of those particular forms of survivorship, if you try and build a theory of survivorship per se, drawing upon each of those particular substantive theories, what you end up with is a much more highly conceptualised outcome where you try and identify what the common themes, the common aspects of survivorship is that, that would be found across all of those areas. Another example would be a theory of reality shock to exposure to the workforce following university study. Um, an example I'll give you presently uh, really is a substantive theory around reality shock, uh, what it's like to be exposed to the workforce for the first time after training to be a nurse. But if you were to do parallel studies where you look at the reality shock of initial exposure to the workforce after studying undergraduate nursing and also undergraduate occupational therapy, undergraduate social work and undergraduate medicine, if it were the case that the, the, that the reality shock had sufficient similarities across each of those categories of new graduate, you could build a, a formal theory uh, of reality shock to that initial exposure to the workforce uh, that takes into account uh, the commonalities of experience across each of those categories uh, of new graduate health professional. So there are the differences between substantive theory and formal theory. Most of the uh, grounded theory research I've ever seen, whether it be in the context of student um, research, say masters by research, PhD, or indeed uh, undertaken uh, more broad studies by, by professional researchers, has tended to be at the substantive level. Uh, generating formal theory because of the labour intensiveness of the methodology could be a huge undertaking and I've seen few studies undertaken at that level so far. Still with data collection and grounded theory, some of the different types of data collection, field notes, uh, and you'll come across field notes in many different types of qualitative research. Uh, these are a record of observations and interviewing commencing from data collection. Occurrences or turns of phrase from participants are recorded as these stand out, that is, as they, are, as they impress themselves upon you as being meaningful. Um, uh, they are included as part of the research record, uh, or they provide reminders of the context of an interview or an observation. So if you're um, in the acute adult psychiatric uh, unit that I've been referring to by way of example, and you see something that really captures your attention, um, and that relates to some aspect of theory, uh, or that you're building around this, you might make yourself a field note reminding yourself of this particular instance. One particular example that jumps out for me, um, which I think I might have also given um, uh, in the previous lecture on ethnographic research, is the instance of uh, having taken students for some time into a, an acute inpatient adult psychiatric unit and had discovered as a researcher something I hadn't noted previously, which was a cutoff switch under the staff uh, in the staff office that would automatically cut off a telephone call on the public phone that patients could use that was located on a wall adjacent to the staff office. Um, now, you know, this clearly raised issues of, of human rights uh, and autonomy and a range of, of ethical issues that I thought were theoretically important. Now, whilst I wasn't conducting grounded theory research in that particular study, um, I did nevertheless make a field note to remind myself of how I felt, how surprised I was, um, and the, thought that, the thoughts that were going through my head when I made that discovery on that day, and that certainly became an important piece of information in the ethnographic research I was conducting um, as part of, of, of that study. But I could just as easily have been conducting grounded theory research and building a substantive theory uh, about some aspects uh, of that particular service, uh, and this would also have ended up in a note in, in my field note, my field journal. Um, there are also theoretical memos, and these can be thought of as records of analysis, so ideas, insights, hunches, questions, interpretations that inform and direct ongoing data collection, analysis and theory building. These can be typically fairly detailed and should be dated to enable them to be located within the research time frame at a later stage. This is an important suggestion, by the way. Uh, typically, when you're conducting field work, uh, even uh, as part of student research, you may find that you'll fill 
a dozen stenographers, notepads, you know, over even a couple of months, uh, even, you know, sort of attending a particular study site one day a week or one day a fortnight for a six-month period, for instance, you can easily fill a couple of notepads shorthand or longhand, and it's important to date uh, and come up with some sort of an approach so you can easily retrieve these things, because when you're writing up, if you remember that something happened that you want to include um, and particularly highlight in your write-up and your analysis of that research, and if you can't remember which of the 12 notebooks you've got, you can spend a day or two trying to find it. So dating um, and numbering uh, your, your, and trying to have some sort of a simple index system is really important. It, it can get you out of a lot of difficulty later on. Now let's take a closer look at coding because this is really very much at the heart of grounded theory, of analysis and grounded theory. What you'll often initially come upon when you look at the grounded theory literature is something called open coding. And this is, if you like, the initial stage of, of analysis. This is a process of initially breaking down and conceptualizing the data that op operates over three levels. So here, here's a, a, an example taken from some of my own research that will flesh it out. If you think of level one as the most simple level of open coding, this is initial and often provisional coding derived directly from the data. And an example might be a new graduate nurse says, I really wanted to be accepted by the other staff, and you code this as being accepted. Then the next level of analysis, imagine the researcher condenses or collapses codes into groups of concepts with similar characteristics. So, for example, new graduates discussing the various types of knowledge and skill necessary to work effectively. And here you're dealing with more than one person and you're actually talking about a range of possible skills that relate to what it is that, that new graduates need to be able to do to be able to work effectively as new graduates. You might code these under becoming a skilled helper. So this is a higher level coding. And then at the highest level, this is level three, building up major categories from data formulated on the basis of the researcher's professional knowledge. So this is where you're bringing together those things that your respondents are telling you, but this time you're adding what you already know about this phenomenon. So in levels one and two, you're still relating directly to what your respondents are telling you at two different levels of coding. But in level three, you're adding what you know yourself, either from your own professional knowledge or perhaps even from some of your reading around the topic, which, by the way, you'll be doing by this stage. So this is building up major categories from data formulated on the basis of the researcher's professional knowledge and an example here would be new graduates mentored by expert practitioners as a humanising force in public mental health services. And the code here is humanisation effect of new graduates. So you can start to see how the further through the levels of coding you move, the more highly conceptualised or abstract these codes become. The idea of a humanisation effect, I'm sure you'll agree, is rather more highly abstract than the idea of being accepted or becoming a skilled helper. Now, after you move through that initial stage of, um, of coding and categorization, you move to a thing that in the literature is often referred to as axial coding. Now, some types of grounded theory will refer to axial coding, and some types, particularly um, uh, um, if they've been undertaken and reported in the last 15 or, 20, uh, or, or so years, may actually omit actual coding. There, there's an ongoing debate about whether or not actual coding is something that stands aside from the coding process that I'd mentioned in the previous slide. But where you do see this term, it refers to the process of reassembling the data, which now also incorporates the developing theoretical ideas and themes identified by the researcher including the incorporation of ideas from literature review and other data sources. So you're a fair way into the analysis by the time you get to axial coding, and it definitely involves um, uh, the combination of things that you know, things that you've read, things that you've become aware of as a result of your literature review, combining this with things that you have identified, things you've become aware of, ideas that are emerging out of the data that you've collected from your field notes, your interviews, and other sources of actual data collection. 
Saturation is a term that in all likelihood you've come across already. Um, I can't recall if I mentioned it in the previous lecture on ethnography. It's a term that is often used in grounded theory research and it refers to that stage of data collection or the end of data collection if you like where no new information is being generated in the category uh, or no new information on a category can be found in spite of attempts to collect more data from various sources. Uh, in other words, um, at some point you reach the stage where you're hearing the same sorts of things over and over and over again from the 10, the 15 or the 20 participants in your study. No new information is being, is being um, provided to you. Um, what happens in practice, of course, is you probably never reach the stage where, where you're getting no new information, but what you'll see is that there'll be a gra initially gradual and then a fairly sudden petering off or drop off of the flow of new information coming in. And at some point you need to make the decision that uh, you've probably picked up on the most important things that you're going to learn about this phenomenon of interest and anything new that, that you're still picking up ought to at some stage be considered relatively minor in the context of your overall study. Um, saturation is important because unlike quantitative research, and this is important for ethics application purposes, one of the questions you're asked in an ethics form is how many participants are you likely to recruit to your study? And in grounded theory, it's often very difficult to know. Um, at what point do you reach saturation? Will it be after 10 interviews, 10 hours of field observation, 30 interviews and 100 hours of field observation? The answer to the question is very much like the answer to how long is a piece of string. That is, it depends. Um, so saturation is about the best that we can do. So in an ethics application, you know, what you might point out is that you're going to use the principles of saturation, but on the basis of other research conducted into the phenomenon of interest or in, or in similar research, you know, in topics that are similar to the one that you're undertaking, where some 25 participants were needed, that your best guess would be you might need to interview up to 25 participants. If, of course, you find that you've got the 25 and there's still lots of new information coming in, and you think you might need to extend it substantially beyond 25, say to 40, that might require um, uh, another quick letter off to the Ethics Committee to seek approval to extend um, the anticipated size of the study sample. If it's one or two over what you had initially stated, that usually isn't a problem, but if it's substantially more than that, it probably will be. Now, what you end up with eventually in, uh, in, in grounded theory research is a thing called the core category. And I mentioned that word narrative. So in a sense, the core category is a, is a narrative. It's the story that emerges out of your research stipulated at a fairly high level of abstraction. So the title of Glazer and Strauss's classic 1967 book was the discovery of grounded theory. And similarly, they argued that the core category arising from grounded theory research has to be discovered. That is, it, it, it has to emerge from and is grounded in the analysis of the research data. So you're not taking pre-existing theory into grounded theory research and testing it. You're actually generating theory as part of your research process. The core category runs throughout the study, effectively providing the key narrative for the study. And it has to be seen to operate across time, to recur and to explain the behaviours and interactions of participants. Whatever else the core category does, it tells a story that is systematic, picks up most of the broad concepts that have emerged from your study, and ought to be able to be seen in similar sorts of circumstances and similar contexts in other places. So whatever your core category is for the study undertaken in an adult acute psychiatric service, say in your home region, if you went off to another state and looked at a similar unit, looking after similar sorts of patients, where the staff backgrounds and staff mix are similar, you would expect to see much the same sort of thing happening there. There could be some important variations, but broadly the patterns of interaction ought to be similar. So, to give you an example of this, in the research that I conducted looking at the experiences of new graduates um, in their first year of new graduate work working in, in, in mental health services, um, in, in a public sector mental health service, the core category that, that emerged from my study was learning to fit in. In other words, what the story was basically telling us at the broadest and most abstract level was that whatever else it is that new graduate nurses were doing 
in that new graduate year. They were learning to fit in. And this comprised four, three broad themes that comprised a number of categories and subcategories. So at the broadest level, they were learning to fit in. Learning to fit in meant getting along with more experienced and senior staff. It meant learning to work alongside sometimes difficult staff. And it meant having a job and building a career. And if you go down to that next level, getting along with more experienced and senior staff, at the next level down, um, how did you go about getting along with more experienced and senior staff? Well, you started trying to learn, identify and learn the skills of becoming a skilled helper. You learned how it was to be with consumers. In other words, what's it like to sit alongside a highly distressed, very anxious person without feeling as if you want to get up and run away because you feel very inadequate? These are not things that are easily learned in a textbook, so there's a phenomenology and an experience about this. So how did they come to acquire that sort of on-the-job learning? What was that like? Getting along with more experienced and senior staff was about being ethical. And one of the themes that came through the study was that these new graduates often found that the ethical principles they'd learned as book learning at university were often contradicted uh, or made much more problematic when they saw them being played out um, in, in often ethically contradictory clinical locations. So they gave lots of examples of um, people being going off to the magistrate to, to see whether the magistrate would allow them to be discharged from a psychiatric hospital, for instance, um, under the Mental Health Act. And of course, you know, everyone on the ward telling that the, the consumer as they were going off to the magistrate, don't worry, it'll be fine, you'll be able to go home. But the new graduates knew because of the scuttlebutt you know, the, the, the behind the, uh, the nursing uh, office door whispers between staff that the patient, actually, the consumer actually had no chance of going home, that the magistrate was going to renew their order. Um, and they felt that that was grossly, grossly unfair and, and highly unethical, which I'm sure we would all agree with. Um, but they had to learn to come to terms with this. What do you do about it? How do you assimilate that? Should, should you speak up under those circumstances and put a different view to staff, or should you not? given how junior you are in the scheme of things. And of course, um, becoming accepted, and of course what I've just been talking about, you know, the, uh, the tensions associated with being ethical under the circumstances I just described, uh, how do you reconcile that with wanting to be accepted as part uh, of, of, of a health professional and particularly a nursing team um, if you were to come up with points of view that might not be regarded um, uh, as, uh, as acceptable by other more experienced colleagues? So these were the sorts of themes that came up as part of the, the broader theme or the categories that, that, that were listed or were identified under the broader theme of getting along with more experienced senior staff. Learning to work alongside difficult staff, the, the main, um, there were a number here, but uh, time doesn't allow me to go through them in detail. The main one, one was learning to deal with hostile and indifferent staff, and there were many, many examples of the, the tensions and issues that new graduates faced having to work with staff who were burnt out didn't like having to have uh, new graduates around, uh, examples of, uh, of uh, staff who'd been working in the hospital for 25 years refusing to show the, uh, uh, the new graduate how to uh, use a, a telephone system so they could transfer a call from one ward to another, things as petty as that, for instance. And the final category was about having a job and building a career. And that was about the experience of initially, when they first started their new graduate year, their first new job, it was initially about uh, the anxieties and tensions and anticipation of I've got a job, I'm now going to get a salary, but will I be performing well enough to be able to hold that job down? But as they became more experienced over the course of, say, six months into the, the job and beyond, they then started thinking more about, well, what do I do, need to do next? Should I take, po take a postgraduate study? What about my career plans? Do I want to stay in mental health or would I rather go into some area, other area of nursing such as accident and emergency? So the, their concerns shifted over time from uh, just the, the pros and cons of initially having a job to one of starting to think about how do you build a career. And when you put that all together, the core category that all, all of that was comprised within was learning to fit in. And what you see... Uh, uh, in a moment, um, uh, is um, I'll actually specify for you what the core category for that study was. A closer look at 
uh, constant comparison. I think, unfortunately, somehow my slides have got out of order. So I'll go through this one and just correct it as we go through. Um, constant comparison I've referred to, and this is the process of coding and categorization, and it involves constant comparison. Initial data collection and analysis results in preliminary codes and categories. As subsequent data are collected, these are compared against existing categories and checked for fit, checking for similarities and differences. And constant comparison also typically involves use of the literature as a source of data in its own right. Um, and that's an important consideration. Um, the idea that in grounded theory, the literature, rather than being largely a preliminary exercise undertaken before you undertake the research, is actually, in broad terms, another form of data collection. So you collect data through field observations, field notes, interviews, group interviews, uh, individual interviews, looking at other documents that might exist within a particular study setting, but of, of with exactly the same status as research data would be what you're getting out of your literature review. Um, so this is quite a different way of thinking about the the use of literature and grounded theory, just to flesh that out a little further, one of the interesting aspects of grounded theory research is the way in which the literature is used as a data source. As I've said previously, grounded theory researchers try and bracket their preconceived ideas regarding the phenomenon of interest. There is, of course, a debate regarding the extent to which this is possible, and this typically includes refraining from engaging in a detailed literature review in the early stages of the project, and apologies, I have said some of that previously and somehow the slides have got out of order. Uh, this is what uh, Glazer, and uh, Glazer and Corbin in a much more recent publication uh, said about the use of literature. Um, um, uh, and I'll leave you to read through that. It just fleshes out what I've said already in terms of some, some more specific guidance about how, they use the, how, the, how literature ought to be used in grounded theory. And these are just examples of um, studies that I've been involved in where literature has um, been used. So in the, uh, that study I've been referring to about mentorship, we looked at uh, literature from healthcare, the nursing workforce and recruitment and retention. We looked at literature on mental health, nursing recruitment and retention. We looked at literature on mentorship. We looked at literature on clinical supervision. And we looked at clinical supervision and mentorship, whether or not there were similarities or differences between the two. So we looked at all those forms of literature as part of undertaking that study about the experience of, uh, of uh, um, clinical nurse consultants providing mentorship to new graduate nurses in their first year in the workforce and drew upon uh, the, those, very, uh, those various forms of literature. So as you can see, there was an extensive literature review, but most of that was undertaken as part of our data analysis and interpretation, not prior to the conduct of the study. And I did say earlier, and this is the, we've now got back to where we should have been. Um, this is the slide that should have come up about three slides back. So if you look at the core category or the key propositional statement as an example um, of, of the broadest level of abstraction, the main narrative that came out of that study into mentorship for new graduate nurses, this is how it was stated. And in fact, this is the way it's been published in the published version um, of the findings of that study. New graduate nurses working in a regional mental health service experience their graduate year as a process of learning to fit in to what often seems like a hostile working environment. Whilst learning to work alongside new, more senior nursing colleagues, some of whom seem unmotivated and or poorly, openly hostile, um, new graduates also find themselves negotiating various nuances of the healthcare organisational culture. At the same time, new graduates work hard to develop the know-how necessary to work effectively in mental health services, including being with consumers, being ethical, and becoming a skilled helper. Consolidating initial, initial employment and career planning are also key concerns. The emphasis on learning to fit in often undermines opportunities to use the idealism brought from university studies as a progressive force to bring local improvements to mental health care. Structural group, structured group mentorship by expert mental health nurses can provide support that underpins opportunities for new graduates to make a difference. 
So just as in uh, any other research publication where you uh, provide an overall summary um, of the overall findings of your study, this is the equivalent for grounded theory research. This is the, the highest level of abstraction. Um, uh, this is the actual theory that is generated by a grounded theory study into mentorship um, of new graduate nurses. And this is the way that it existed uh, in the public. This is the way it was written up entirely in, in the publications that have uh, uh, been generated from that research. Uh, so just to finish some problem, some common methodological problems and issues, I said initially that uh, uh, grounded theory research uh, is challenging. Um, uh, so generating description rather than theory for grounded theory, i.e. claiming to have undertaken grounded theory research but instead undertaking qualitative descriptive research. So it's important to know what it is that you're actually doing. If you're describing the thing you're interested in, you're not doing grounded theory research, you're doing qualitative descriptive research. And it's important to know and understand the difference. If, if some of you are going on to do research higher degrees, there's nothing worse than writing a thesis that claims to be a to, to use grounded theory methods, sending it out to the examiners, some of whom will be experts in the use of that methodology, and having them in their, in, in their examiner's reports say, this is not grounded theory research, it's something else. Um, so it's important to know what it is that you've actually undertaken. Another problem area is inadequate data analysis resulting in poorly formed theory. So here the grounded theory, the researcher, uh, in grounded theory the researcher should be able to clearly demonstrate how the theory has been pulled out of the data. In other words, you need to be able to provide an audit trail. You know, if, if I, um, if you were to come up with a theory about uh, survivorship, experience of surviving cancer, you need to be able to identify where that theory came from, to trace it right back into the, in the actual information or the observations that you took in relation to conducting the research. Mixing up purpose of and theoretical sampling suggests that sampling has, has been more on the basis of the researcher's assumptions about the phenomenon of interest than developed out of the, should be data, not data collection and analysis. So this is a, a problem of bracketing if you like. In other words, the, uh, the person has gone in, conducted the research, um, and they've already, if you like, anticipated their findings rather than having the findings emerge out of the actual research that they've conducted. Of course, this is not a problem restricted to grounded theory research. This can happen in any sort of research where uh, researchers' prior assumptions interfere with their, uh, the way they conduct and therefore the outcomes of the study, but it's a particular problem in grounded theory and potential for computer-assisted data management and analysis to distance the researcher from the data. I think this is a problem of theoretical sensitivity. And note, I'm not in any way suggesting that we shouldn't be using um, uh, computer-assisted uh, methods such as some of the programs such as uh, uh, the old Anudis program or, or in vivo um, to assist us with data management. But one of the problems is that, that what, one of the aspects that are absolutely vitally important in all forms of qualitative research is that the researcher immerses themselves in the data. Now, I think there is a potentially a risk that if you're over-relying on, on, on a computer-assisted data management program to sort and organise your data and you're not reading it, re-reading it and re-re-reading it yourself, there is the problem that maybe you'll be more distant than you need to be from the data and therefore you might start to run into problems of theoretical sensitivity. In other words, you might miss important things that are in the data that you really ought to have pulled out of the data had you have been closer to it. Um, you will see in the literature, and I, and I really caution not to get overly caught up in this, but uh, in the decade or so before Anselm Strauss died, which was in the mid-1990s, there was an apparent divergence between the views of, of on one hand, hand Glass, uh, Glazer and on the other hand Strauss. In the early 1990s, Glazer um, criticised Strauss and, 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 and Corbin for having significantly altered the procedures and meaning of grounded theory. He suggested, for instance, that what they were describing at that stage was not actually grounded theory in the original classical sense of the 1967 uh, Glazer and Strauss text. Glazer was concerned that Strauss and Corbin now sought to address more specific research questions rather than starting with a research interest. So this is part of the issue about going in with a, a too highly specified research question rather than starting with a broader research interest. 
and thus ran the risk of researcher preconception, preconceptions influencing the ways in which the participant's data is approached. An important consideration. Glazer also suggested that Strauss and Corbin had shifted to an approach based on verification, that is, uh, an approach that was much more to do with hypothesis testing, rather than based on inductive reasoning, that is, proceeding from the specific and the concrete to the more general and abstract. Glazer also expressed concern regarding the use of literature and grounded theory, arguing that in any form of literature, initial literature review would be likely to contaminate data and influence the theoretical sensitivity of the researcher. And I've said a fair bit about this already, and Glazer was concerned about that. He was much more in favour of data being used at the level of analysis to inform the development of categories. So, as and, and it would be fair to say that in the mentorship project that I have been referring to, that, that I conducted with some colleagues, um, we were following Glazer um, more than Strauss and Corbin in the sense that we quite purposely uh, we, we did some very basic initial reading and we also knew a bit about the literature in the field. I mean, being uh, people who are professional uh, educators of nurses at the tertiary education level, it, it's in inevitable that, 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 that we would be, uh, of course, because uh, you, know, you can't teach nurses and nursing without knowing something about nurse education and about new graduate issues. But we quite purposely avoided going in and reading the literature in detail until we'd commenced... Um, um, data analysis and particularly the later stages of data analysis for the reasons that Glazer had suggested. And, and very finally some cautions. While grounded theory has perhaps the best described methodological procedures of any qualitative method and I think this is the case. If you look at the various texts that have been written we've got very well described um, procedures for uh, sampling for data collection for analysis uh, and this is a methodology that's been with us since at least 1967 earlier than that but in terms of, uh, of easily available publications so we're now talking about uh, uh, you know really 40 years or more um, so the methodology has built up built up and it's very very well described but as I've said several times it is very labor intensive it necessarily takes the research into theory generation and is thus highly abstract. It can be very time consuming because of the labour intensiveness, um, you know, the labour intensivity. It can involve method methodological orthodoxies with accompanying turf wars along the lines of the, uh, uh, the Glazer Strauss debate that I've just referred to uh, in the previous couple of slides. And if you're thinking of going on and doing a research higher degree, or if indeed you're already a half research higher degree, and you're thinking of using a grounded theory, I would recommend that you find a mentor or supervisor who is very familiar with the methodology. Take great care to identify a well-focused and clear research interest or question. That you aim to generate a substantive theory rather than a formal theory. That is, stick to a specific context or situation, because it's much more containable if you do that. Um, one of the issues is you don't want your uh, master's or your doctoral project to blow out to a length that can't or a size that can't reasonably be managed within the time frame of a research higher degree, uh, for instance. Uh, for those very reasons, I don't think grounded theory is really a methodology for honours projects, if any of you are doing honours, by the way. Um, I just don't think it could be completed within the time frame for an honours project. But by all means, it could be done as part of a research higher degree but particularly if you're restricting your project to the level of generating or building uh, or substantive theory generation. Demonstrate that you are aware of the main methodological debates relating to grounded theory, but select a particular version and stick to it. Um, so to me, it doesn't really matter whether you stick with the original Glazer-Strauss version or the later Glazer version or the later Strauss and Corbin versions or some of the other versions. Um, there, there are other more recent versions um, that, that in fact were developed by others than, than Glazer and Strauss. They're not the only uh, gurus in the field. Um, and they look upon more con constructivist theory, if you like. And some of this work in particular has been undertaken and developed very usefully within the, uh, the broad field of, of occupational therapy research. And I think it's very worthy, uh, some of the developments that have taken place uh, in that form of, 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 uh, of grounded theory research as well. I'd suggest you stick to one particular version. Don't try and justify why you're using it. I think you don't need to. All of these various versions 
are quite well established um, within the field. And, and for heaven's sakes, don't attempt to resolve some of the methodological debates within the field, not at least until you're a guru. That is a, mess, a, a, a recipe for disaster. I think the thing to do is to include a page or two demonstrating to examiners or demonstrating to the readers of a journal article that you're wanting to have published within a peer-reviewed journal that you are aware of the debates. But I, I would leave it at that. I wouldn't try and get into resolving the debates, partly because it's uh, a very complex, difficult, uh, and in many ways acrimonious debate. Um, but equally, I suspect that theoretically and methodologically, to some extent, some of these issues are really not resolvable. They come down in the end to people's uh, philosophical and methodological um, predilections. And because you're dealing with human preferences, in, in, in a number of instances, I don't know that, that a, a one-size-fits-all resolution is going to be possible in any case. Thank you. I hope you found this introductory lecture useful. I do hope some of you go on and consider at some level using grounded theory research. No doubt all of you will at different times, if you haven't already, will read some grounded theory research. There are a few references that um, hopefully you will find useful. Thank you very much and good luck with the, uh, the rest of this course.